Hey folks, you know one of the things about antennas that have always really kind of confused me just a little bit is impedance. Impedance is a really tricky subject when it comes to looking at antennas, but it's, it's really one of the more important ones. Now antenna design, antenna theory uh, is just full of variables. I mean it's it's definitely, I mean, you can get a PhD exclusively focused in antenna design, so there's a whole lot that goes into it. But we're going to focus on, I think, one of the more basic pieces, and that's impedance and impedance mismatching. How we're connecting antennas to lines and then to receivers. And one of the best ways to visualize that, in my opinion, is with the good old Smith chart. Um, that we have up here. Now this, this is what's called an eminent Smith chart, um, and it's, it's kind of more of the, of the, the common one used today. The Smith chart was invented back around like in the 30s, like 1939, 1940 time frame by a dude named Philip Smith. And he said, man, I like this so much, I'm gonna name it after myself. Um, but it really, the guy really enjoyed looking at math uh, visually. And so what he did is he came up with this concept of concentric circles and having a positive side, a negative side, uh, an imaginary side, and a real side to really determine how to uh, visualize various antenna components. Now there's a lot of stuff that we can do with this. So we're gonna take one basic simple example, hopefully get you started on Smith charts, and then you'll really dig into it. Now understanding this stuff will really up your geek factor to the max. You'll see a lot of the old school guys that are really into antenna engineering, when you ask them a question about impedance or anything, they'll look up in the sky because they're visually picturing out their own little mental Smith chart. Now we've got away from this a little bit, unfortunately, with computers and MathCAD and stuff like this, uh, but it's still really no substitute for really understanding how it really works on a real scale. So let's take a look at what we do. Let's say that I've got a, uh, a common circuit here and I've got my, uh, uh, my, my standard antenna uh, or, or my receiver here, so that would be my ZN, my impedance N. That's gonna come across, this is my line or my length. Now the length on here, when I'm talking about length, I'm actually talking about wavelength. We're not really wavelength, but the length it takes for a steady state, a sinusoidal waveform, to actually make a complete circuit, right? For it to do this, to go up, back down, and come up again. That's actually a complete state. Now, that's what I'm referring to in length. If you're looking at something like, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, 60 hertz, 60 hertz length is about 3,100 miles. Um, so that's definitely very low frequency stuff. If you're looking at like two gig, um, two gigabits, your length is about, I think it's about, 0.75 uh, centimeters. Um, it's really, really tiny. So that's what we're talking about with length. What is our wavelength, not our wavelength, but our uh, uh, sinusoidal waveform length uh, to form all the way out. Now we have our load over here. We'll represent that with just a squiggly load line. Um, that will be um, our Z uh, load, ZL. And we wanna actually find, uh, of course we got our Z naught too. Uh, we'll have to know that. Um, and we want to find, we got our antenna, this is our antenna side, and we say, okay, well, we got our equations here. We want to know if we compare this antenna with that actual access point over here, and what are the right characteristics for it. Okay, so we get our antenna, we break it down, and the one thing we know is we say, okay, well, our Z characteristic, our impedance characteristic of that is 100 over 50, and then we're going to add that to our uh, normalization values, 100 over 50 ohms, right? That's our J values, if you will. Uh, when we add those together, run that equation, we get two plus J2. Now this is our first step in actually plotting this out uh, on the equation. All we did, we took what our impedance character, what's stamped on the antenna uh, right up here, and we actually added these in so we could get a nominal value that we could plot uh, on this chart. So we go across uh, on our Smith chart. This is the center. This is our 50 ohm load here. Everything kind of references itself from the center. We've got two here. So we do a plot of two, doo -doo -doo, right there is two. Bring that on down. And then we find our other plot of two, and then that comes over here. Boom, now there's our intersection, is right about here. Now this is actually showing what our, uh, our ZL, our load factor is. This is two, uh, which is what we want. Now our next step, what we're gonna figure out is, is really what our, uh, uh, link, our wavelength, our sinusoidal wavelength, like over here, what this is actually gonna be uh, on this circuit. Now we know that because uh, we're using, let's say in this example, uh, four gigabits, uh, on four gigabits, we're looking at an L factor of about 0.2 lambda, um, to, to add that in, so we'll add uh, 0.2 uh, on that scale by actually crossing that through here. 
bringing it up. And that takes us right out to about 0.21 uh, on our scale. So 0.21 at our intersection, we plot it from the center because this is actually our, our consistent. This is where we normalize and use the 50 ohms. A lot of times when we're doing antennas uh, and we got to uh, terminate them, our, termina our termination load is always 50 ohms because a long time ago, that was back in the 30s too, they decided that the way coax lines were built, that 50 ohms was the best value to use so you have minimal loss and maximum gain on any type of power uh, on a circuit. So this was set a long, long time ago. So at the center, our norm normalization is 50, uh, 50 ohms. We, we do that, we plot that straight through. Uh, we know our wavelength here is 0.2 lambda, uh, and we're going to try to figure out what this is to connect to our uh, uh, antenna. This is a lot of times what's called the generator if you look at materials. So though some materials are actually we'll call this towards the generator or TWG. To find the TWG, we actually look again on the Smith chart and we look, there's a lot of little uh, uh, indicators on this outside wheel that tell which way you calculate stuff. Now what we're looking for is this one right here. It says wavelengths towards the generator. That means if we're figuring something out to go to plug into the generator or to the access point, we wanna go this way clockwise around the wheel to figure that out. So up here I've got 0.21. I know that my uh, wavelength value for my length up here is 0.2. So now all I'm really doing is simply taking 0.2 plus 0.21. Adding those out, I walk around the wheel. Here's 0.33, 37, 394, 41. Right there is my there, right there is my plot point. And now what I want to do is draw a line and connect that straight through to here. Now that plot point is showing me uh, what, what should be my impedance input uh, on this device. So now I can take 0.2 and now I plotted 0.2 up here. Remember like we did right on this side here? We plotted 0.2 going this direction. So now we're gonna plot 0.2 uh, basically going negative. So we'll come down to here, be about right there. And then you take that number. That's actually, this is my arc. I'm actually gonna space that out a little bit. This is my rotate. I'm rotating towards the negative uh, to figure this out because I'm actually going kind of opposite direction uh, for what I want my match to be. So this is my rotate variable. Now I take my rotate variable and I bring that up to the center line. That takes me about, bring it right up here, at about 0.35 is about where I should be. Uh, on that wheel, that's right, isn't it? Let me see, up, round, yeah, there we go. So 0 0.35 is my, uh, my, my next variable here, or what it really amounts to as a piece of my Zn. This is not actually, this is where my Zn starts, which is where my impedance input starts, uh, but there's a couple factors you gotta cal calculate in here. Zn is actually what's known as my real number. Now, the part that really confuses folks on Smith charts is there's a, what's called real and imaginary numbers. Real numbers are simply numbers that are actually burning up power. The power that's actually being generated and shot out the antenna, that's actually called a real number. There's also another set of numbers called imaginary numbers. And imaginary numbers are where people kind of get freaked out a little bit because imaginary numbers are the numbers that are stored uh, at the antenna array itself. It's the power that is kind of stored there. It's kind of left over uh, from this unit. And that's where we really get bit on the impedance side is when it comes to the imaginary numbers. Now imaginary numbers, this is where it makes Smith charts are just so awesome because we can really plot this out and we can see this. Okay, my real number is 0.35 on here. So now I want to plot out my imaginary number. And my imaginary number is just simply, I just go down here and follow the next arc down. That next arc down takes me to 0.6. So now I take 0.6, that's my J number, that's a negative number, right? Because I'm below this line, this is my line of resistance right here. This line of resistance, resistance never changes in a, a frequency. This is a, a real important thing on a Smith chart. You're seeing all these crazy circles running all over the place um, because you're really seeing the effect that frequency has on impedance and capacitance inside of an antenna. But resistance never changes. Resistance, resistance does not respond to frequencies, whether I'm uh, you know, 60 gigs, or excuse me, 60 hertz, or two gigabits, my resistance stays the same. And that variable is actually what makes the whole Smith chart work. So now I plot this down to uh, 0.6. That's, these are my negative going numbers, my negative side. My J value is uh, 0.6. So now, this is, these are just basically Smith chart numbers. These are not actually uh, referenced out in ohms yet. So now I gotta actually convert these. Um, and to convert these out, I take my Z output number, my Z naught, uh, multiply it times that. 
that should actually reference me out to 17.5 uh, with a J number of about 30 ohms. And that's the number I'm actually matching up to um, to get this to work. I know it kind of looks a little bit complicated, uh, but it's really not. Um, Smith charts, they just take a little bit of time to work with, and you can do everything with these things. And they totally, totally, totally maximize your geek value. But the thing that I like about them the best is that I can plot changes over time and I can see what type of impact that is. If, for example, that my, uh, my, my value up here changes, my antenna load changes, I say, oh, you know what? I actually got an antenna that now has a value of three. I can plot that down here and I'm just actually bumping everything down a notch and I can see how this stuff interrelates. There's software programs that tie this stuff in and you can move these values and you can see everything is chained together and it moves all over these charts and they just really give us an incredible nice visual way to see what's going on anytime we make any change to an electronic component. Smith charts are great. Uh, one of my favorite sites to reference this is a site called antennatheory.com. Um, the guy actually has a nice tutorial on there, different than the one I showed you. It, uh, he actually walks you through some, some different paces, which is good. But these are just endless use, and it's kind of an old art uh, and very, very cool. So I hope you get a lot of use out of it.